afternoon and uh, welcome to the second uh, lecture in our uh, program uh, on the world of electrical engineering and uh, and then we are delighted to have uh, Professor Yael Hanin from the Department of uh, Physical uh, and uh, the title is uh, Bionic People, Science of Fiction. So I guess it will be science, right? Otherwise, it will not be there. Okay. So, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, usually people complain that I speak too uh, softly. But, um, okay, so I guess most of you, the, the older bunch, uh, remember Steve Austin. But uh, I don't know if... Uh, the six million dollar man. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds. I, I know it doesn't sound familiar, but uh, okay. So um, so let's start with this. So I'll uh, begin first with some examples that are not um, directly related to um, uh, what we're doing, but just just to give you a flavor of what uh, what is being done today in this field. So um, today in the in this uh, era of uh, digital image processing, you you may think that this is not real. Photoshop or uh, some uh, manipulation of the image, but uh, this is actually uh, Amy Mullins. Uh, these are her legs. Uh, she has, uh, as you can see, 12 pairs uh, of legs. Uh, she was born with a, a pretty severe defect in her feet and uh, at a very early age, uh, something like a year old, uh, they had to amputee uh, to, to uh, remove her legs uh, just um, and um, still you see that she doesn't have her own legs, uh, which you may think uh, is a completely devastating. Uh, she actually has a very uh, um, very interesting lifestyle. She's a model, as you can see, she, she looks uh, pretty good. Uh, she's a public speaker uh, and she's an athlete, uh, among many, many other things. You can actually see a, um, a TED talk. Actually, she has two of them. Uh, she's a very, very uh, impressive person. And the point is that these uh, prostheses that she has, these legs, um, are very, very fancy. It's a very, very fancy technology. Now, um, there are other conditions, like uh, in this case, it's another Amy, just by coincidence. Uh, and this is even. What may appear even, well, but this, this is definitely a more tragic uh, situation. Uh, Amy was a student, uh, just like you, but unlike you, instead of spending her time studying in Israel, she was partying uh, in some, I, I think the story goes that it, it was after some uh, heavy drinking uh, or something. Uh, in any way, she, she fell, she, she had uh, some exposure to, um, um, a very violent bacteria, and at the end she lost both her legs and her uh, hands. Okay, so this is pretty tough. And so here it's not about maintaining your mobility, this is really maintaining your uh, capacity to survive. And what you see there are again very, very fancy prosthetic hands, but she also have uh, fancy prosthetic uh, legs. Uh, and you, as you can imagine, this requires some serious engineering. Um, now, how does it work, or how generally does it work? And just to give you a little bit of a, a flavor, and I'll discuss several things in, in the 45 minutes that we have, and um, I, I won't go into any specific detail, but just to give you a flavor of the complexity of this field and where it's heading. So um, this is just your eyeball, or this is not your eyeball, but this is a, an eyeball, um, and you can see that uh, a typical eyeball should have six operational muscles in order to uh, move it. So uh, most of the time when you move your gaze, you're actually shifting uh, your eyeball rather than moving your head, but what you, no you may not realize that you do it a lot. Your, your eyes are uh, having this very, very rapid movement. Uh, next time you stare into somebody's eyes, you can do it now maybe, but you, you, you'll notice that there's this uh, very, very uh, fast, it's called saccadic uh, movement. So the eyes are constantly uh, moving and scanning. So you can imagine that if these muscles don't work properly, uh, this means that your image processing uh, gets damaged really, really quickly. But in any rates, 
uh, these muscles have their uh, control clearly from the brain. Okay? Why does it need to be controlled from the brain? Because you need this feedback. You need to know how fast you want to scan things. So it's clear that any muscle has to come, uh, has, must have some command from the central processing unit, the, the brain. Uh, but this is just one example that I just wanted to, to show you. So um, all of these muscles receive very complex feedback. The feedback is whether you're dealing with a, like a, a scenery like as this, that there's no nothing around and I can just walk, so I don't need to focus too much. I can look at you and I know that I can move freely, rather than the situation where I know that there are a lot of uh, you know bad things on the ground and I have to uh, watch out and I have to check uh, the, the the scenery. So we need to control the muscles, but we also need to control them in a very sophisticated sophisticated way. But in in any rate. Um, the way it's being done is through electrical signals that come from the brain through nerve cells that uh, deliver signals to, to the muscles. Now, if you want to control a muscle, you can control it originally uh, in the normal way through, uh, through the brain, but you can do it in an artificial way, right? You can actually approach the muscle somehow, say with electrodes, uh, or you can sense the electrical activity uh, around the muscle or the, uh, the nerve cells that deliver the message to the uh, muscle, and you can try to use that in order to control the muscle. So imagine a situation where uh, you don't have the, uh, whatever the, the muscle, the muscle is gone, but the um, part of the muscle or part of the uh, system that comes from the brain is still here, okay? And therefore, if you can record the signals that are approaching and, and, re and coming from the command center, you can use this information in order to control a prosthesis. And this is the reason why these prostheses are very, very uh, uh, complicated. They're very smart in the sense that they can receive incoming signals, but in the case of the legs, for instance, they can also receive uh, signals from the, the ground so they can compensate for pressure. So these are very uh, complex and very interesting uh, systems. Now, I want to use the example of the eye because this is something that we use and study a lot, and I'll, I'll, I'll continue and describe it uh, a little bit further. So, as we said, we have the eyes and we have the muscles, uh, so you have these six different uh, uh, degrees of freedom, if you will, and then you have the nerves. These are the yellow things that go to the brain. So the brain is considered the central nervous system, and then uh, there's a whole range of, uh, of system that goes and connects to the periphery uh, of our body, okay? Even though the, the eye is really an extension of the brain, but the muscles that control the brain, this is, uh, this is the peripheral system. Um, and of course, we have all these sensing uh, elements all over our body that connect to the, connect to the brain. Okay, so now, why, did, why is it so important to understand uh, the brain? Because the brain connect, uh, controls everything and connects everything. And the other thing is that um, I want to demonstrate to you how important um, the brain is in, in this example. So this is um, another story. Uh, you're probably not going to hear. The, 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 the details are not. Uh, so important, but you see the same person. I'll make it a little bit lower. Okay, so the, you, you see a person that is uh, the same person working as a hairdresser, and then you see a person with very severe tremors. Okay, it's the same person. The difference between this condition where this lady has the tremor and the condition where she doesn't have the tremor is when a device implanted in her brain is on or off. Okay? Uh, she suffers from uh, a condition, there, there's a range of conditions, uh, essential tremor, Parkinson, uh, a range of diseases where this command system that I was telling you about uh, is broken. It's broken in the sense that, you see, every, otherwise she's, she's perfectly normal, everything is healthy, but she has one little spot in her brain, one, it's, it's a couple of millimeters, not, not much more than that, that continues to deliver uh, uncontrolled uh, messages to the outside. And that is causing this, uh, this tremor. 
And so by delivering electrical stimulation to that particular spot, you can um, silence that particular spot. And by, um, as a consequence of that, you, you remove that and you allow a person to conduct uh, a perfectly uh, normal life. Now, in this particular case, the, the, the incredible story is that she was a single mother. And as a single mother, uh, having this uh, condition where she cannot work anymore, that's really a uh, pretty, pretty tough uh, situation. So it's a, it's a, it's a really a little, little tiny spot in the brain and um, a very uh, crude situation. Now, a milder, I'm, I'm reviewing all sorts of things, but I, I hope you can see the, uh, the, the, the common denominator. So um, I'm jumping a little bit to cat, the, 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 the manner by which we think cats see. Okay? Now, um, on the left, this is how we see, um, this is our color perception, right? You see the different colors. And on the right, this is how we think um, a cat see uh, the parrots. Now, how can we possibly know how cats see? How does that relate to electrical stimulation of the brain? And how does that relate to bionic vision? So, I'll tell you the story. So this is a liquid crystal display, okay? Or any other display for that matter, you know is made of these fundamental colors, right? The red, blue, green. This is very, very fundamental. Um, you know historically um, that um, we, we all know that, right? This is something we, we learned uh, at some point that you can make uh, white color, that white color can be built from combination uh, of these colors. And some of you may even heard uh, that Newton was the guy who was experimenting with uh, prisms and made this uh, demonstration that you can take white light and split it into uh, different colors. Okay? Very shortly, we'll understand how do we know why cats can't see colors. Um, another guy that you may not know yet, but I, I promise you that by the end of your uh, Four years here, you're, you're going to love this man. Uh, actually, it's, uh, in this particular case, it's a beautiful story because he did uh, a lot of his studies apparently with his wife, uh, who couldn't attend uh, uh, the university because back then uh, universities were not open to women. I look at you and I think that maybe this is still the case still now, but uh, probably not. But in any case, they were running these experiments together, and what they've done was also to demonstrate that in our eyes uh, we have the same um, we, we have this mechanism that is sensitive to these particular colors okay because in principle you can make uh, white you can make white light with different combinations of colors it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, green uh, red and blue but um, it's really in, in our eyes that we have this uh, combination. So he was the responsible. You, you will learn about him probably from um, totally different things. He did a lot of uh, incredible things, probably one of the uh, most uh, important physicists that ever lived. But uh, th this is a, a, an absolutely uh, beautiful experiment and beautiful de fundamental demonstration that he and his wife worked out. So it's really the blue, uh, green, and red that has something to do with our eyes. What, what they did was to uh, really try and play with different combinations of colors and, and demonstrate that these are the colors that we're uh, sensitive to. And um, they didn't really know how the eye uh, was built. They didn't really know much of the details. It was really from an, another guy, uh, a Spanish guy, that was studying, uh, you see, pretty much uh, at the same time was studying the uh, structure of the eye. And when he uh, studied the structure of the eye, and this is where we're coming back to the, to the brain, uh, he found out that the retina, which is the part of the eye at the back of the eye, which is responsible for vision, uh, the retina has the three different layers, three fundamental different layers, one of which is actually neurons, cells that deliver electrical signals to the brain. So it's the same cells that connect to muscles and deliver information to muscles. The same cells are in the retina, and their wires, their connections, go back to the brain. So the retina 
has a mechanism, uh, a neuronal mechanism, mechanism which is very uh, easy to, to spot. And these are his drawings. This was back at the time when there were no um, digital cameras. So um, Cajal was sitting uh, with a microscope. And he had a very uh, good talent to drawing. Every good scientist needed good talent to, to draw things, because otherwise uh, it was impossible to, uh, to document what you were doing. There were no cameras. So he had to look at the microscope and make these uh, fantastic drawings. Um, and so by, by the way, uh, Maxwell uh, was fantastic at making uh, mechanical demonstrations of his uh, uh, physical models. So back then, everything had to be very visual or mechanical. You couldn't just put things uh, uh, with equations, and that was it. So um, these are the cells that uh, Cajal uh, was um, uh, looking at. Uh, these are the neurons that actually deliver the information to the brain. But which are the cells that actually receive the light? Uh, these are the cells at the back uh, over there. You see uh, those uh, rod-like and cone-like uh, structures. And it turns out, uh, and this was a very long debate uh, of many scientists uh, looking at uh, different hypotheses, but the general understanding is that we have three different uh, um, sensors there. We have a blue, sen blue sensitive sensor, a green, and a red one. And this is where what Maxwell and, and his wife are recording in their experiments. Okay, now we have to get back, hopefully, to the cats. Okay, so this is the retina. We have these rods and cones. You see uh, the rod structures. Um, you, you see the, uh, the rods are the blue, so they have strong blue sensitivity. And you see the uh, uh, red and the green and the blue. Uh, uh, these are the uh, cones. You see the, the cone shape and the, and the road shapes. Okay? And, and this is what we have. But um, different animals have different combinations of cons and rods and different sensitivities. And I think by now you can understand why cats cannot see red. Okay? They cannot see red because there's the combination of uh, rods in um, cons in their uh, retina is different. So they, they simply uh, don't have uh, that sensitivity. And therefore, people that are colorblind it's coming from about the same situation. So now you can actually uh, look at the, uh, these color maps, and you can maybe figure out. It happened to me once that somebody in the audience during this part of the presentation realized that uh, he was actually, she was actually colorblind. So this is your opportunity. So if all or some of these look the same, uh, you have a problem. <laughs> but uh, not a very severe one, but a little, a little one. Uh, it may actually be a pretty big one uh, if, uh, uh, if this is the... Uh, so color blindness is, is not so bad, but uh, should never be underestimated. Okay, so now let's, let's wrap a little bit things um, back to, the, uh, uh, to, to our discussion. So we have the eyes, we have the muscles, we have the brain at the back, we have uh, fibers that go from the brain, control the muscles, we have feedback going back to the brain, and when everything is working, it's fantastic. When we have just a little part of the system that goes crazy, uh, things can go really, really, really bad, even if it's a little tiny part of the circuit. It's very different from electronic circuits. In electronic circuits, things are very, uh, sits in compartments. So you have one circuit that was designed to do one thing, another circuit was designed for one thing. Uh, in the brain, it's very different. In the brain, everything is integrated. Uh, there's no strict separation into uh, functional capacities. So there are a lot of things that are interconnected together. Um, and it's very, very different, difficult to, to separate things. OK, so this is the system. Uh, one other thing that I like to show when I uh, give such talks is uh, this slide where I ask people if they can understand what the connection is. No? <laughs> lots of, uh, lots of, uh, Brain damage. Uh, do, do you recognize the guy on the right? That's Muhammad Ali. And so, so what's the connection? So on the left, you see a woodpecker. And, and a woodpecker spends uh, most of its time just banging his head uh, on, the, um, uh, on trees, making holes. Uh, Muhammad Ali and many uh, professional and even amateur 
uh, boxers uh, with pretty bad percentages uh, end up with uh, syndrome which is very much like uh, Parkinson or dementia. Okay, including the tremors that you've seen before, uh, pretty bad uh, situation. So for people to receive direct hits uh, to, their, uh, to their head is highly not recommended. Uh, you know, it's not just about getting one knockout and uh, feeling a little bit dizzy uh, for a few minutes or a few days. It's a really long-term effect, and with some people, it's, it's, it's one way uh, without any recovery, like in the case of Muhammad Ali. Uh, but uh, woodpeckers <laughs> are fine. Uh, so woodpeckers actually have, uh, it's, it's probably belong to the mechanical engineering domain but wood, and, and biomedical, but woodpeckers have fantastic mechanism, a whole range of mechanism. For one, they know exactly which way to, um, to hit the, the tree. So it's not just uh, going straight. They have this very directional uh, approach. Uh, the other thing, they have some kind of lubrication. So the brain has some, uh, uh, is, is protected. And the other thing is that the skull have a very uh, special uh, three-dimensional porous structure that uh, somehow absorbs the, uh, a, lot of the, uh, a, lot, a lot of the power. So, um, um, they're actually trying to, to use that. So, so this is uh, the analysis. So, just, just so if you wonder what people are doing in universities, so this is, uh, these are two examples. So on the right, there are people trying to analyze how woodpeckers uh, hit, uh, you know, handle the, the way they, they hit the, the tree. Uh, so they can analyze the, the mechanical force and, and why, how it uh, prevents them from uh, uh, damaging their brain, and on the left, uh, this is a, um, a scanning electron microscopy uh, analysis of the structure, the inter internal structure of the uh, um, of the skull, um, and and people trying to use that to learn. This is uh, what people refer to as biomimetics. You can take uh, this understanding and convert it into the design of, say, new helmets, so you can make better helmets that provide better protection. Okay. So we, we, we already have some grasp of, of the importance of the brain, how the brain controls things, how we can use that in order to control prosthesis. Um, the point is that whatever has, whenever we talk about the brain, we have to appreciate the complexity, we have to appreciate the enormity of the system. Again, nothing like um, a computer. In many ways, the numbers are similar. <laughs> Modern computers, modern CPUs have a uh, similar uh, number of, of, of cells. The, the difference is the variety and, and the adaptivity. So the system, as you can uh, imagine, uh, the system always changes. It's not a static system that just is designed by an engineer and, and remains stable for uh, the duration of its uh, operation. There's but it's... True. In any rate, um, so, so th this is just uh, one of these building blocks. This is a, a cell, uh, but again, if you compare a typical cell to the complexity of, say, uh, uh, a transistor, uh, in, in terms of complexity, by the way, there's a, there's a whole field which is called, uh, it's, it's, it's science of complexity. Uh, you, you can even give a measure for that, but it's, it's, it's a really, really, really complex system with lots of, of uh, different uh, proteins and different channels and, and uh, this is something, just this image can cover several textbooks uh, just understanding how this thing works. But why does it matter for us as uh, future electrical engineers or um, current electrical engineers is because uh, even though these are chemical biological systems, right, this is what our brain is made of, uh, there are some elements in, the, in these cells uh, sodium channels and potassium channels, for those of you who may have heard the terms, that actually respond to electric field. So you've all seen uh, these television series about uh, hospitals, right? Uh, somebody is dying and then uh, some other people are rushing with these uh, uh, two electrodes and um, providing, a, everybody goes, take a distance away and, and applying a, a large voltage and, and the heart begins to, uh, to beep again. Um, you can actually do that to single neurons, but at the much, much more gentle uh, weights, it's pretty much the same thing. So neurons are always electrically active, 
it's they're kind of similar to to uh, to heart um, um, cells, but um, their their activity is is, is a little bit uh, different. Uh, but they're all, they're constantly electrical active, and this electrical activity is the is the process where we process information. Okay, so everything you do, you want to move a muscle, it's about electrical activation of neurons followed by electrical activation of the muscle. So it's all about uh, uh, chemistry that goes back and forth, but you can also use electrical stimulation in order to artificially activate the system. Okay? So this is just uh, the, the beginning of the link with uh, electrical engineering. So when you see an image like that, what you see on the left, like there's signals, um, it's, it's, it's real. I mean, you can record electrical activity uh, of the brain. Uh, you can do it from the skull. You can do it from uh, with, within uh, the brain. You can actually put uh, electrodes and you can record the electrical activity of the brain. You can do the opposite thing. You can take electrical, uh, you can take electrodes and put them in the brain and you can stimulate the brain as we've seen with the uh, essential tremor uh, examples. So both cases work. Uh, in the case of the smart prosthesis, you actually perform electrical recording through the skin of muscles uh, and electrical activity underneath uh, the skin. Uh, in the case of the uh, electrical stimulation uh, to the brain, in the case of the essential tremor, this was a single electrode uh, deposited uh, in, the, in the brain. Okay, so these are, these are more details. And let me go in the last uh, uh, part, of the, part of the talk uh, to focus back uh, at the retina and the eye, okay? So you remember we talked about uh, the rods and cones that we have at the back of the eye and providing visual information that then is being transferred uh, to the brain. Uh, so schematically, the, this is a cross-section of the eye. You can recognize the cornea. The cornea is the transparent thing that you see uh, at the front. The white stuff, this is the sclera. Uh, I don't know if there are Hebrew speaking uh, people here. So why should I continue speaking in English or? Yeah. Oh, okay. But, but there are some. Okay, so uh, as a. Uh, uh, this is the uh, sclera. Um, and then at the very back we have the choroid. Okay. And all around from, from here, right? All, all the way from here. To the back, there's, there's the retina. So we, the way you can convince yourself that the retina extends so far away is you, you can do something like this. You can look straight ahead, move your hand, and then you see that you, you actually see very, very far to the side, right? So it's, um, it's, it's, it's really very wide vision. And again, different animals have different capacities. So uh, <laughs> Udi may be... <laughs> Well, Udi is falling apart, so uh, he's not a good. Uh, um, so you see, for instance, this is our, our, our lens. So for people who are uh, from, from optics, it's actually very interesting because different animals have totally different optics. Uh, so imagine yourself being a rat. Uh, a rat needs to worry about uh, what's going on here because uh, you need to have food, but you also need to worry about the eagle. Okay, so you need actually uh, a lens that would allow you to do, you need a bifocal lens. So, um, and so, so different animals have totally different optics in the eye, and different animals have, as you, as you remember uh, that we've seen, uh, they have different sensitivities uh, to colors. Uh, you all know that uh, uh, cats and, uh, I mean, they, they don't see, uh, they, they kind of see black and white. Uh, it's just compensation for different tasks. Every, every animal has its own uh, niche. Um, now, so, so we have the retina. The retina is all, uh, all over here. Um, and then we have the cells. And then all of these cells, all of these neurons, uh, have a single primary uh, axon, an extension, a wire, that uh, goes from the cell, consolidate into a bundle. Okay? And this bundle, this is the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is not an optic fiber. It's a bundle of, uh, of, of nerves. And this thing goes to the brain, reaches uh, um, an initial processing uh, unit, and then goes on to the, next, uh, to the next level. Now, imagine a situation where these cells um, are gone. 
And it could happen um, usually uh, following two primary reasons. One is genetic. So there are a couple of uh, diseases where people begin to lose their um, uh, vision. And actually one of the ways, usually it starts, well, um, in, in those diseases it starts from the, from the edges and gradually progress towards the center. And this is usually this test of uh, uh, identifying your visual, your, your uh, peripheral uh, vision. This is where, uh, this is when they, they actually uh, discover it. Usually in Israel when people uh, make tests before their military service. Uh, and this can happen at fairly early age. Uh, so the onset of the disease can be uh, around the age of 20 or even earlier. And at some point after, uh, the, around the age of uh, 30, 30, 40, people become uh, completely blind. So it begins, <laughs> it's okay, Udi. you're okay. You're too old for that. <laughs> now, so this, this, these, are, these are genetic diseases. But then there's another disease, which is age-related macular degeneration, <laughs> much more relevant. But AMD, which is very common, uh, actually begins from, the, from the, the macula. And the macula is here. It's the center of the, uh, center of the retina. So many uh, older people. And the older the population is, the, prevalence of the, the, the more common uh, AMD is, uh, suffer from this, this disease. It begins from the center and then uh, spreads out, okay? So commonly people don't complete, retain some visual perception because as we convince ourselves, uh, we have uh, the visual capacity stretch all around the retina. But the, uh, our fine uh, color uh, vision is, is destroyed and our ability to read, our ability to navigate, uh, all these things become uh, very, very problematic. So this is really, uh, Losing this layer uh, essentially means uh, blindness. And the more severe this, uh, this condition is, basically it means ultimately uh, complete blindness. And again, it could be uh, at relatively early age or it can be uh, uh, very uh, late in life. Now, uh, biologists uh, try to find a solution for this for the past 40, 50 years. Uh, there's enormous amount of effort trying to rebuild or prevent the onset of this disease. Uh, there's an enormous amount of investigations. Uh, people understand a lot about these diseases, but uh, there's no solution. And therefore, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, a little bit uh, longer than that, but seriously, 20 years ago, people started developing an approach uh, where you can actually put electrodes inside the retina, okay? So you can take array of electrodes and place them either here or here and stimulate the retina. Okay? So you can take a camera, right? You can take a, a tiny camera that costs, I don't know, five dollars. You can put it outside. You can build, say, a transmitter or you can send somehow the information to the electrodes and you can put the electrodes here and you restore vision. That's the simple idea. Okay? Um, and this is where your role begins. Okay, this is where when electrical engineers uh, start working and this is how it looks like. Okay, uh, pretty awful in my mind, but uh, no, this is, this, is, uh, this is amazing because um, these are devices that are purely uh, engineered, right? Uh, these are arrays of uh, uh, photodiodes. Okay, They're, th these are th th this uh, device over there was developed by uh, a German team, first at the university in Tübingen, and then later on uh, in a company. And it's an array of uh, photodiodes, pretty much the same structures that you have in your uh, digital camera. And in addition, uh, there are electrodes, just as we described before, uh, that can deliver electrical pulses. So the visual information comes from these, uh, pho these artificial photosensors, and you have the electrodes that deliver the stimulation. And this structure is then implanted, inserted into the eye, okay? Implanted uh, at the back of the retina. The retina is, uh, is kind of peeled off and the device is uh, introduced underneath the, the retina. And the wiring and the external power is implanted uh, somewhere around here uh, under the skin. 
uh, this is a, a different uh, system where you take the uh, electrodes and you put the electrodes here on top of the retina and you have all the wiring and the processing and you have the coil this is a coil you learn about it also Maxwell I guess uh, so you have the coil and the coil is is, is placed here uh, it's it's replacing the um, uh, the lens and you have a camera outside here and then the camera is talking with uh, with this device so this is this is hardcore electrical engineering uh, the difficulty as you can imagine one million. One million. In, in a healthy retina, you have about a million fibers no, going. Those cameras in the cinema. Oh, 20? Oh, you see here, it's uh, 5 by 5. 25. In this one, it's 25. In this one, it's in principle 1,000. But in practice, they cluster them, to, uh, they bundle them together. So it's, it's the, same, the same thing. Right. So um, now, the, the, the project on the left started in 95 in Germany. Uh, there's another project in the U.S. In both cases, they already have uh, conducted a clinical trials, and in both cases, they have uh, approval, uh, CE and FDA approval. Uh, the thing, though, and, and these are two patients from the two uh, clinical trials. The, the, the crazy thing, though, is that, um, and, and so, so these people basically can, can have some visual perception. So, so you can see in the demonstration on the left, they place a banana and they place an apple, and, and this guy who um, both, both uh, suffer from RP, retinitis pigmentosa, this is the condition where the blindness begins from, um, the, from the edges and, and completely overtakes the, uh, uh, the, the visual perception. Uh, he, can, he can distinguish between, these, uh, between the apple and the banana. You see in very uh, sterile, very high contrast, uh, environment. Um, these trials started about 10 years ago. Uh, overall, there are about 100 people. There are several other teams that uh, are making clinical trials. There's a large effort at, uh, in Australia, University of Melbourne. Um, there's, there were another, there, there was some, uh, a large effort in Korea. Uh, there were a few other uh, projects. What, what is the challenge, uh, and what, why, why these things are still so um, so far from, from where you, you want them to be? Um, the answer is probably this, is that the electrical engineering um, that, that you see here, all these devices, they, they were really designed for, um, I mean, if you, if you would open up your cellular phone, you would see things that look uh, pretty much like these, and they're made from the same material and made with the same technology. And it's probably not the best uh, technology uh, when, you want to, uh, when you want to interface with, uh, with the retina. Um, so what, what does it mean to interface with the retina? So we said, we, we, I told you a little bit about it. Um, I'll show you some more examples of how we actually do it. So um, you can take, um, and, and then I'll say a little bit about, about what we're uh, actually doing in terms of this uh, technology. So imagine, um, so think again about the retina. OK, so this is the retina. Um, you can take a retina um, from, say, an eye of a mouse or an eye of a, a cheek. Uh, we, we often use um, uh, cheeks. Um, and they have very, very large eyes. And so we can remove the, we can re remove the retina, and we can put the retina uh, on array of electrodes, and we can perform such uh, very specific, you know, very systematic studies uh, to understand how this system uh, is working. So this, on the left, you see a retina that was stained uh, with special colors. So you can actually see the different cells, and you see the fibers. You see all these green bundles that converge into the uh, uh, optic disc, which then goes as the uh, optic nerve. So you can take a, a retina um, and remove it and, and put it. Uh, and on the right, you see it on, on an array of electrodes. OK? And then you can start uh, stimulating it and recording it, right? Because you remember, I told you that you can stimulate it, and you can also uh, record the electrical activity, because at the end, these are ions going back and forth. So um, what you see here is kind of a process data of experiments 
uh, that we do in the lab, and you see the, right, the, the bright uh, white square, this is the spot of the electrode where we give the electrical pulse. And you see the, uh, all the other uh, bright areas. These, these are the areas where we uh, observe the uh, electrical response. Okay? So it's, it's a live tissue that we take from the eye, put it on electrode array. Uh, of course, we have to provide it with uh, the medium and the uh, um, exact condition in terms of temperature and pH and everything has to be uh, carefully uh, maintained. Uh, but basically, you can have a, a perfectly nice and working uh, retina. Uh, I'll show you some, some more examples so you would have a sense of um, how, it, how we can actually work with these systems. Because so far, we talked about neurons and we talked about electrical activity, but we didn't really look um, at, the, uh, at the signals. So typically, it looks like this. These are now neurons from uh, rats, but it doesn't matter. So you see all these uh, round shapes. Uh, that every now and then light up. And you see the electrode at the center. And you see the trace running uh, at the bottom. So the trace that you see running at the bottom, these are the actual recordings from the, uh, this electrode that is positioned at the center. And you see that there's an exact correlation between this uh, burst of uh, bright light and the uh, electrical signal that we measure uh, from the electrode. Um, and, and this is really the electrical activity of neurons. This is how uh, electrical activity looks like. And uh, this is something that we can easily record. And as I said, we can also run uh, electrical stimulation. Uh, so even though these are perfectly biological elements, you can treat them and work with them and understand them uh, as um, uh, physical uh, electrical uh, creatures. Of course, they ha they're not as predictable and not as uh, nice as uh, dry electrical elements, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly electrical system. We understand uh, the model, we understand how they operate, we understand how uh, to interface with them. And the challenge is really to be able to, to do it in the most effective way. Are so, the wiring between the Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see that they're all synchronized. Oh, between the electrodes? Okay, yeah. No, no, no. So uh, each electrode is. Each one is independent, and each one is collected the to its own. Are below. And the wires are below. You it's can see the wires. wires. Yeah. yeah. Each wire goes to uh, an independent amplifier. So th these are the wires going on. Hmm? Okay. Oh, okay. 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 The dean is helping me. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Okay, so this is just, just to show you why this system is not as nice as uh, typical uh, electrical systems, because in electrical systems, usually, you expect everything, everybody in the system to be the same. So if you have a billion transistors, all transistors basically should be uh, pretty much the same. And if they're not the same, you will make the process so they would uh, behave the same. Here, every neuron is slightly different because, th and this is part of the complexity that I was telling you about before. Uh, every neuron has a little bit, something a little bit different. So it may have higher sensitivity to electrical stimulation. It may be uh, bigger. It may be smaller. All these things make it a little bit different in terms of its electrical uh, properties. So what you see here are different examples of uh, neurons that responded to electrical stimulation. So we, uh, we have these electrodes, and we run the electrical stimulation experiment that I showed you before. And we look at uh, specific neurons. So in this particular case, uh, we look at this neuron. Okay? And here we look at this neuron. And here we looked at this neuron. And we just identify which are the electrodes that stimulated it. Okay? So you see that in some cases, uh, it's really nice and easy. So it's the electrode which is sitting right next to the neuron, which is something that intuitively you would think that it makes sense. If, if you know anything about electric field, you would think the electric field would be higher right there by the electrode, and this is where you want things to happen. Uh, but as you can see, sometimes uh, it doesn't work like that, and sometimes it's really strange. Sometimes there's a whole bunch of electrodes that somehow stimulate uh, one single uh, neuron. And the reason is because, uh, as I said uh, before, uh, it's not just one mechanism that triggers uh, activation in neurons. There are many 
mechanisms, and this is what makes our life in this field uh, pretty miserable. Um, how do you connect them to the wire? The neurons, how, how are they connected to the wire? Ah, so typically, um, what we do... I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the question, but, but generally what we do, we, we use the electrodes are uh, deposited on glass, and you have to use some material that would make uh, the, the neurons uh, to bind to the surface. Um, and so there are proteins, there are uh, certain molecules, uh, and, and there's a whole... The connection is local. It's local. Uh, not really. Not, not in this particular case. In this particular case, it's all over. Uh, sometimes we do local, uh, local attachment. Okay, so there are lots and lots and lots of details, but we're kind of uh, running out of time. But this, this, are, this is one uh, part of our investigation, which is to understand how to better stimulate neurons. Because if you remember, for instance, the, the, the uh, central tremor uh, problem, we have to reach a very specific part of the brain that uh, is causing the problem. And so therefore, it's very important to understand how stimulation uh, works. Or in the case of retina implant, we have to deliver a visual information, a very complex visual information, so we need high resolution. So this is a very uh, fundamental issue that we, uh, we study. And we have to use many, many different techniques and, and approaches how to, uh, how to do that and to understand things. But this is just, just to give you a kind of a flavor for that. And the other thing, which is the primary activity in the lab at the moment, is really to try and build uh, artificial retina, but an artificial retina that would not require a lot of wiring. So you remember that um, those devices that I showed you, these artificial, the, the um, uh, artificial retina devices that I, the bionic eye uh, systems, had the electrodes, but they also had all this wiring uh, coming out, and this is a really, uh, this is a problem. Uh, alternatively, you can, you can use silicon, and silicon is photosensitive, but silicon is very hard and very uh, not uh, necessarily uh, perfect for, for, such a, for such an application. So we're trying to come up with a totally different approach uh, how to do that. And what we do, we use new materials uh, that were discovered. Actually, this, this particular material that you see here, this is a, a nanotubes. It's kind of a, a merge between... Uh, graphite and diamond, and this material was discovered in '91. Okay, it's a fairly uh, new material, and it actually provides us with a lot of really exciting uh, properties that makes this interfacing uh, with the neurons much much better. So we can actually make uh, very efficient electrodes for uh, stimulation. Um, the other thing is that there are more and more materials that are coming out that can allow us to bind these materials to the carbon nanotubes so we can make the electrodes not just more effective but also photosensitive so we don't need the wiring. And our dream is really to, um, to have something which is this big. You see a couple of uh, millimeters. So this is a magnification of this thing um, where each pixel would be a crude version of the photo, <coughs> photo sensors that we have at the back of the eye. Okay, so it's not going to be as effective. We don't have, uh, we, we can't assume that it will be as effective as the uh, uh, as the photo sensors. But we want a cruder version, but at least uh, much more efficient than the system that uh, I described to you. Those uh, very messy, large uh, electronic circuits that people are trying to implant to the um, uh, eyes at the moment. Um, and um, since you're at the beginning of your career, uh, most of you, um, <laughs> these are uh, just so you have a flavor of uh, who are the people that actually uh, do all this work. So um, this, this, these are most of the people in my lab, not all of them. Uh, Eitan is not really part of the lab. He's uh, kind of, uh, uh, this is Eitan. So Eitan is... Uh, uh, yeah, very, very soon, coming up. But uh, the rest of the people are postdocs and engineers and uh, uh, other graduate students. And occasionally, uh, on rare conditions, we have uh, undergrads uh, working in the lab. But uh, they really have to uh, do all the dirty jobs first before we uh, allow them to do something more than that. But um, that's it.
So thank you very much. It's the same technology. It's exactly the same technology. It's it's complete. It's fundamentally it's it's completely possible. The the challenge is really economical and uh, putting the effort into these technologies. So at the moment, um, th there's nothing fundamentally that you can't um, that, that you, why you can't use this technology in order to uh, to help people after stroke and uh, and help people. Um, with various uh, paralysis, uh, but you really have to develop the, this technology. So the, the trouble, for instance, with, um, say, DBS, this uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, is that the target population of uh, patients uh, at the moment, after uh, more than 10 years of, of uh, uh, procedures, is uh, just a little bit over 100,000 people. Okay, if you compare that to, say, typical drugs or... Uh, it's it's very small population, so that that's that's one limitation. The other limitation are the costs involved and the complexity of the uh, of, of investigating and developing this technology. So, for instance, if you want to develop a technology, an invasive technology to treat uh, a person after stroke, you have to develop develop an animal model for a stroke. Okay, and people people have done that. Um, you have then to convince yourself that you can treat um, those those animals, and that the uh, that the benefit would be significant enough that you can move to uh, to humans. Um, in the last, I think that you can say that in the last several decades, the economy was not such that uh, there were strong enough incentives to uh, to develop these technologies. Uh, it is possible that um, things may change a little bit because a lot of the pharmacological treatments have saturated in the uh, in, in in terms of the uh, what benefit they can give on one hand, and then on the other hand, the economical load, uh, the economical burden of uh, older population uh, with uh, pretty increasing numbers of uh, people suffering from stroke and and these conditions. Um, so it may actually trigger the uh, stronger effort towards uh, development of these technologies. So sometimes, not sometimes, often, it's not just about uh, whether something is possible or not. It's really about this entire, it's, it's not just about funding. It's, it's more than just funding for research. It's really about the investment and the uh, development. It's, it's really an entire ecosystem. So for instance, the, uh, the bionic eye, the American uh, um, system, uh, the overall investment was way above $100 million for one company to, uh, to develop it. A lot. A lot of money. It's an enormous amount of money. Such money does not exist in... My dad suffers from ALS. It's very Everything is there. Just bypass something. When you're starting to do any engineering, you say, "All right." Have so you, there's one technology. So this is a, it's it's th this personal issue is, is very interesting because there's one technology uh, that I didn't mention, which is the cochlear implant technology. Uh, so there's DBS, a single electrode. There, are, um, cochlear implant is is a array of electrodes that are inserted into the into the ear and stimulates the ear and basically um, restore, um, per, um, 
restore hearing. So, so people that uh, lost their hearing or children that were uh, born uh, deaf basically can uh, gain uh, hearing. Um, the first guy to develop it, uh, Professor Graham Clark, uh, was an, is an Australian uh, physician. His father uh, was deaf, and his life commitment was to develop a technology so his father could, uh, could hear. It took him years. It took him over 30, uh, 40 years of initial investigation, and uh, at some point they started uh, experimenting with cats. They had good enough uh, demonstrations. They managed to secure massive funding, funding from the Australian government, and then they managed, uh, after a couple of years, to, uh, to get something. And they were the first to get an FDA relatively quickly. Uh, probably today it would be impossible to do something like that so quickly and, and have a device on the market. And today they're uh, Cochlea. It's an Australian company, which is the leading company in this, uh, in this field. And actually, th their spokesman is an Israeli guy. Mm. One of their spokesmen is uh, an Israeli company. Which is, uh there are several related technologies uh, for, for various conditions where people try to, to stimulate, but the more invasive it is, the more uh, challenging it is in terms of the, uh, of the testing and the... Uh, But I think in, in, in terms of the, the first things that I showed, those, uh, those clever uh, prostheses, this is where uh, you see immense uh, development uh, over the last several years. Um, I think the, uh, this, um, you, you, you <coughs> it, it's really a technology that, that really made a, a huge leap. Uh, it, it was, a, again, a very gradual, but uh, but what it provides today is, uh, is, is quite quite impressive. So you are working on some kind of a new living, they can say, uh, retina, or artificial retina, but it's, implant, it's done by living cells. Well, you use the cells. So what is life? What, what do we do? Have you, how do you maintain it? How do you maintain the... No, so the system we build is completely dead. It's completely artificial. There's nothing live in it. Uh, we're, but the point is that we're trying to make it as similar uh, to, the, uh, to the original system. So rather than using uh, the external wiring and the, the, the standard silicon technology, you, you bring in uh, an alternative technology that can, uh, can, can do the stimulation without uh, all this wiring. Th there are, for instance, today you, you have photo, uh, uh, photoactive polymers that were not out there 20 years ago. I mean, we, we just had a paper with uh, an Indian team that just developed, uh, I, I didn't show these results, but uh, you can take electrodes and coat them with uh, uh, a new type of, uh, of a polymer, and you shine light on it, and that stimulates the neurons just, just on its own. So, in principle, again, you, you have the technology, and the technology can do it. It's really, but now working out uh, the details, whether it can survive for a long term and it doesn't cause any uh, damage, whether it deteriorates, whether it's stable, you know, all these, uh, all these things. But it's really the convergence of, of different technologies uh, so, so sometimes um, you have the fundamental ideas, but you don't really have the, the technologies to do them. Uh, so you need to wait a little bit before, uh, before you can move on. Okay. Don't be at this point. Okay. Most of what you were talking about was about internal implants. What does it feel on external implants? So, so the devices I was talking about at the beginning are actually external. Uh, so the, there's some internal manipulation where you, uh, you want to regenerate the growth of the, uh, uh, of the nerve so it would be easier to, uh, to interface with it. But otherwise, uh, everything is, is external. Um, I mean, when, when you're internal... Invasive technology is much more 
efficient. You, you get a lot, more, a lot better signal, uh, but it's invasive. So there's nothing in life is there's there's always 